Okay, I am so excited to have you on. And I am very excited because as I was looking back in time at all of our podcast episodes, we talk all the time about autoimmunity and gut health, but I don't believe we've ever actually brought to light just talking about immunity as a whole and what that is in relation to overall wellness and our gut. So I would love if you could almost take us like 10 steps back to where it should have started and talk to us about how, how is immunity and autoimmunity and gut health all related? All right, it's a great question. First, thanks for having me on. I'm excited to be here. You know, it was great to talk to you at the beginning before the cameras were on. And um, again, the opportunity I do appreciate. But there is an interplay, an interconnection between the gut and the immune system. So if you were to look at the gut, I, I always like to refer to the gut as the epicenter of our health. 80% of our immune cells are in our gut. And there's the tie right there. It's where our macro and micronutrients are absorbed. So keeping our gut in its pristine condition is a true critical element. So when we talk about our gut, let's break it down. Let's get a little granular. The gut is basically the small intestine, which is a misnomer. The small intestine is 90 to 95% of the length of the gut. The large intestine, the other part of the intestinal tract, if you will, is only about 5 to 10%. The small, the reason it's called small it's got a small diameter. It's about one centimeter, whereas the large intestine is about two and a half to three centimeters in diameter. The small intestine is critical in that it is a single layer epithelial cell that has the thickness of a wet paper towel. Its sole purpose to, is to allow di small digestible food particles, water, vitamins, and minerals to pass through. It has been postulated that the first time the outside world sees the inside world and actually attacks the immune system is when something gets digested through the small intestine. Now, obviously, if we have something called the leaky gut or increased intestinal permeability, we can get this condition from food sensitivities, an overgrowth of yeast, or an leveling of good and bad bacteria, which we like to refer to as dysbiosis. If we have a leaky gut, we have a higher incidence of liver issues. We have a higher incidence of blood sugar problems, diabetes, insulin resistance, obesity, believe it or not. And some of the bigger things and with my chiropractic background is we have a leaky gut. We have an over-release or an inordinate amount of release of cytokines. We've heard of the cytokine storm. These cytokines lead us down a path of arthritis and joint pain. And we also have a release of MMPSs, matrix metalloproteinases the body's own proteolytic enzymes, which relieve at the time of injury, which eat up soft tissue, i.e. fibrocartilage, like disc injuries. But you asked about immunity and gut and autoimmunity. And here's the big tie, thyroid. I'm sure you see a lot of people with thyroid issues. Uh, thyroid issues really start because 75% are attributed to what I like to refer to as a leaky gut. And lastly, if not anything, the gut to brain axis, the super highway to health, the bidirectionality, whatever you do to your gut, you do to your brain, whatever you do to your brain, you do to your gut. Now that gut and the immune system communicate in that, yeah, I said before, the gut allows for small digestive food particles, vitamins, minerals, water, and believe it or not, it also allows bacteria, fungus, and virus to go through because the immune system is supposed to stay sharp. So whatever passes your gut, can stimulate your immune system. Whew. Yeah, that was a lengthy one. I liked that. That was very detail-oriented for everyone listening. And I like that you connected a lot of different things, whether it was through gut health, leaky gut. For a lot of individuals, they don't suffer with the classic GI complaints, right? They're not all bloated. They're not all constipated. So people don't don't connect that maybe that is where we should be starting when we're supporting our immune system or if we've been diagnosed with Hashimoto's or we've been diagnosed with other autoimmune conditions, there's still a large, large portion of both the medical field and you know patient population that is not knowing, understanding that we should be looking at the gut first, right? With Without question. You know, it's funny how people still, you know, I'll ask my patients, do you suffer from gas and bloating? And they'll say, sure. And, and they'll, I'll say that it shows that there's a sign of digestion problems. Do you get brain fog? Now you got to understand there are no pain receptors in your brain and no pain fibers in your gut. So if you're getting gas and bloating, it's telling you something's wrong with your gut. 
if you're having brain fog, but you're not getting any pain, there are no receptors to have the pain. So it's a great way to ascertain if that gut to brain axis is dysfunctional and not working. So it's a great question to ask. I also really liked that you brought all the information about the small intestine and por uh, portion into this conversation because right? I tell it to, to my listeners, to my patients all the time, when you hear about the microbiome, right? We're often referring to that large intestine. That's what we're looking at mostly on the stool test. And there still needs to be a lot more research on the small intestine, right? So much magic happens there. And it's so overlooked and poorly understood at this point that I think it's the simplicity almost of talking about SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and how, you know, over 60% you know, of people with hypothyroidism are going to struggle also with SIBO, right? We've got connect mm -hmm. one of the biggest causes and contributors to leaky gut is SIBO, SIBO connection. So it's kind of wild how little we know and how simple we try to talk about SIBO and in the medical field of just take rifaximin, take cyfaxin and it'll be, it'll be cured. Right. But I just think it's so important that you brought that up because it's not often talked about, I think on podcasts or anywhere. You just made a great point. You talked about serum tests and I know we'll probably get to these gut barrier tests and stool tests or poop tests, if you will. The poop test is really looking at the large intestine. Mm -hmm. The gut barrier panel is looking at the small intestine. So therefore they're separate. You can actually order them together. And that's a huge takeaway for patients and clearly practitioners because they just don't know what to do. So if you wanted to test your gut health, mm -hmm. and I know we'll get to it, but it puts you in a step one, two, three, serum, food sensitivity slash gut barrier, and then ultimately the poop test because they're all different things. Really well said. Yeah, that that's great. I would love to talk to you and pick your brain about the serum testing for both gut, anything like doing some zonulin through serum versus stool or, but I'd also really like to know what are some labs either you run or you recommend people talk to their PCPs about in terms of looking maybe at the gut as well as the connection with their immune system. Now, this is an exciting topic because we just did step one, two, and three. And so let me put the question to bed. So people ask, do we use the stool test or do we use the serum test to test for zonulin, including we'll get to it. It's definitely serum for me. So it's 100% been shown to be much more effective. The stool test is more for the microbiome and things that are going on, like you said, in the large intestine. That said, some interesting blood markers to see if inflammation is elevated in the body it would be my interleukin test, not my test, but tests that people could take interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-6, which is probably the most dynamic inflammatory marker in the interleukins, interleukin-8, TNF-alpha. These are all great markers to see if inflammation is elevated. They're also great to see if the inflammation is elevated in long COVID. And believe it or not, these are markers to determine if you have musculoskeletal injuries. Interleukin-6 and interleukin-8 talk about the IVD. Interleukin-1-beta talks about disc degeneration. But taking it a step further, getting into what you really wanted me to talk about, which was the gut barrier panel. I really love to take the gut barrier panel because, again, 80% of people's immune cells are in the gut. And I think that most people suffer from some fault in the gut barrier panel. What am I looking for in a gut barrier panel? I'm looking for candida, which is a yeast. I'm looking to see if there is an overgrowth. Now I'm also looking for zonulin. Zonulin is a marker of tight junction function and occluding, which is actually, you're looking at the structural parts, which I'll get into. And the next step, the new guy on the block, LPS. But before we do that, Let's really go over the gut. You know, people say, what's going on in the gut? Well, when you take a look at it, you have to realize that what's inside the gut is an ecosystem. I like to, I'm, I grew up in the Bronx, so I'll call it a neighborhood. And in a neighborhood, you have the bulk of these middle-class guys, which are called commensal bacteria. They take up the real estate in the neighborhood, the ecosystem. Then on the left side, you have something called symbiotic. You have a bacteria that if you give it a probiotic is going to populate. They're the rich kids, and that's a good thing. On the right side, you have what they call the parasitic. Those are the guys that kind of like dump your garbage and do some things they probably shouldn't, but they get their act together a little later. And you have this balance. So you have to have some candida. You have to have some bad bacteria. The problem is when you have an overgrowth or too much bad bacteria, which is typically over 15%, you have something that's referred to as dysbiosis. Candida can mimic dysbiosis. It's an overgrowth of yeast. Candida also is directly related to when the patient has 
mimicking symptoms of IBD in IBS. So once again, in a gut barrier panel, you're going to test candida, zonulin, occluded, and LPS. But what are you going to use as a staple? What are you going to test it against? And this is where the secret sauce really comes to the top. You're testing candida versus something called IgG1 through 4. That's an antibody. But when you test for the most common antibody IgG, there are four subtypes. You want to test for all four because IgG3 reveals something called a complement or a complement molecule called C3D, which is the most inflammatory molecule in the body. You're also testing against IgA, and IgA is interesting in that it's released at a secretory level at the gut, at the mucous, mem at mucous membranes like the lung, and also in the mouth. Zonulin, I'm led to do it. Here is two epithelial cells, the one on the left, the one on the right. Here makes a tight junction. Zonulin is at the tight junction level. It provides pressure to the tight junctions, so the tight junctions can now be compromised and pull apart. Occludin, which you're going to test for under IgG, C3D, and IgA1 and 2, is the breaking of the structure at the tight junction level. So once again, zonulin is function, occludin is structure, LPS, lipopolysaccharide, which holds gram-negative bacteria on the inside of the gut panel. When that is expressed through the epithelial barrier, LPS is an endotoxin, can damage different organ structures alike. It has been stated that the release of LPS increases the incidence of heart attack by three times. Wow. Wow. So I know that was another deep, yeah. I, I did another rabbit hole. I'm trying to avoid the rabbit hole. You can't, you can't avoid the rabbit holes, I think, in this world of, of lab work and, and testing and getting, because you can get deeper and deeper and you need to test more and more and figure out things. I, you, you mentioned a couple different things I was writing down as you were talking that I'm really glad you brought up. Um, one was secretory IGA because I love talking, like that is a huge one and that is very overlooked and so many people either don't support the secretory IGA and right the respiratory system in the gut before trying to treat some of these dysbiotic flora you're talking about, or they're not testing to ensure somebody has proper levels and is actually like, you know, over under secreting this in the body. So I love that you talked about the IGA. Um, I also recently was just asked by a bunch of different people about why I actually don't usually run the zonulin on stool testing, like unless it's asked of me, if you will, mm. part of it's financial, right? Um, for people, but they were like, why is that not your favorite marker? And it's because I'd rather do it in the blood draw, right? I would rather see see it that way, or I'd rather do something like a lactose mannitol test if that's the next step of, of that. Great so, choice. but I, I thought that was interesting that you were on that same page because a lot of people always order it with zonulin. And I think it's not the best way to go about it. No, the, the blood test has been shown to be much more effective, much more accurate. The uh, zonulin uh, stool test is not as accurate. Again, you know, the stool test is better for inhabitants, mm -hmm. not necessarily stressors. But the key component to that zonulin is, and, and that was found by Fasano, Alessio Fasano, who once said, you know, the gut's not Vegas. What happens in the gut doesn't stay in the gut. He actually found it in a 2000 that this was a marker. And what stimulates zonulin? the protein from gluten mm -hmm. and bad bacteria. So ladies and gentlemen, yep. yes, it's bad if you're allergic to gluten. Yes, it's bad if you're sensitive. However, don't eat gluten. Everybody would benefit from a gluten-free diet because the data indicates that you will have a stress and inflammation at the gut level if you consume the American version of gluten. Please move on. You don't have to ask. And going gluten-free Here's a factoid. It takes 90 days to be symptom-free from gluten. So practitioners, if you say give it a month, it's not enough time. And you know how I know? I've been burned by saying that. Yes. 90 I, days. I usually tell people, I'm like, I, I try to take one month at a time with people because throwing people 90 days can be a really, you know, mm -hmm. hard, hard pill to swallow there. But it does, right? I'm like, you, you may not see relief or you may not see a lab change for at least 90 days, right? So, and one exposure to gluten can stay for like three to six months in the body to totally clear. So it, that is a really, really good point to um, bring up for everyone. Do you, do you have a specific test that you like to or company, you don't need to answer this if you don't like that you use for blood testing. And like, sure, I, I, I do not have a problem answering that. You know, I am an open book. So um, I like what we call the gut barrier panel. 
mm-hmm. by uh, it's part of a FIT 176 test. And the company that I recommend is KBMO. I was just going to ask you were talking and say you have to be using KBMO. I love that company. Um, that That is a really good uh, company. Do you often order the food sensitivity panel alongside it or do you always start with the gut barrier panel? It's a great question. I do the FIT 176. So basically we're talking about food sensitivities and in that, it's 176 of the more common food sensitivities, always being fluid, adding additives and emulsifiers. And I always get the gut barrier panel with it. If anything, sometimes if you're going to do like a three months later test or retest, because we always test and not guess. And I know that is definitely something that you adhere to. Um, I may just t- look at the gut barrier panel at that point, but I do the whole thing. So again, when somebody comes in, every patient of mine is getting a composite full comprehensive blood serum test, and they're going to get a food sensitivities and a gut barrier panel. The stool test is sort of optional in a discussion, but that is my standard bearer. I have five conversations with people set up for Friday. We are going all over those blood labs because that gives me a real interesting, evolved view from the body from the inside out. Yeah. That's great. I love that. You you had mentioned the relation with COVID before, and I would, I don't know if we've ever, ever talked about COVID on the podcast. Um, I would love your thoughts. Obviously, some are very data-driven here, but on COVID and the gut connection, and also with the increase of LPS or any other inflammatory cytokine, right? You mentioned the cytokine storm, which everyone I hope has heard of at this point because of COVID. Uh, But I would love to hear your thoughts on how COVID and the gut interplay and why so many people and our patients are coming in, right? And they're like, is there a a gut connection? Why, Why has my gut been a mess since I've had COVID? And I would love to hear that. Yeah, it's, that is without question, my, you know, one of my more favorite topics. Interestingly enough, it's the number one question I ask people, did you have COVID and have you had digestive issues, musculoskeletal failures and everything? So one thing, let, let, let's, let's throw it out there. You shed the virus through the gut. Mm-hmm. So that's number one. So a gnarly inflammatory pathogen, if you have a leaky gut and you're trying to get rid of it, will go through that leaky gut. If you don't, it's inflammatory. So inflammation from COVID-19 promotes excessive gut permeability. There's an increase in tight junction permeability seen in severe to moderate COVID. Steep increase, like you just said, on zonulin release. An increased zonulin is a marker for higher mortality in Hmm. severe COVID. Thank God we're past that. LPS is increased in COVID and so is occluded. So interestingly enough, if you have a leaky gut, and you're trying to shed this virus, it's going to go back into your bloodstream and reattack your immunity. But here's the secret sauce to it all. B cell expansions affect gut health, B cells, antibodies. When you have a tremendous amount of antibodies being released, they inhibit the gut from healing. There's something called epithelial and stromal cells, and they need to re-knit at night, if you will. They're not able to put themselves back together. You can heal your epithelial cells in your gut and or your leaky gut because of the excess release of antibodies. So COVID has a very negative effect on the gastrointestinal tract. You lose your biodiversity. You have a loss of beneficial bacteria. You even get expansions of yeast and pro-inflammatory bacteria, and you have an increased incidence of COVID-19, all leading to uh, bacterial translocation. So when I talk about bacterial translocation, here's your gut. Your gut opens up. And bacteria from inside your gut goes into your bloodstream. And when it's in your bloodstream, your immunity attacks it. You've got all kind of chaos and mayhem, et cetera. So even a mild SARS-CoV-2 infection, COVID-19, can really lead to microbiota dysfunction. There's been data that indicates post-COVID, a year later, people still have a problem and still have dysbiosis. And lastly, I feel bad for women who are going through menopause because menopause, because of the change in estrogen and estradiol, gives a more accessibility to gut permeability. You couple that with COVID-19, you've got this horrible cascade, and a lot of menopausal women have enough problems on their own with the change in hormones, but they're susceptible to leaky gut. So imagine the compromise in their immune system at that point. Yeah, wow. Whole population. I, I didn't really put those two together, but that's a really good. Do you feel like their supplements are for right leaky gut products essentially are 
not, I don't want to say enough, but are they supportive to use throughout COVID for people to try? Obviously it probably won't minimize the complete effect happening, but do you utilize those when people are diagnosed? Yeah. So I am a supplement person. So, but supplemental to what? Supplemental to lifestyle. So I'm a big believer in lifestyle changes. Let's get exercising. Unfortunately, post COVID, there's a lot of apathy. There's a lot of people who aren't as interested in working out. They just don't have the energy. That's part of the long COVID. That's part of the uh, cellular danger response where they shut off the production of ATP and the mitochondria. But I do use a lot of supplements to help knit the gut and also create an an environment of anti-inflammation, pre and probiotics. But again, food first, supplemental to food. Now I live in New York. I think you're in a, a cold climate also. So we don't get a lot of sunlight. So vitamin D is not all that accessible. Uh, Some people on a budget may not be able to afford wild salmon or smash fish, salmon, mackerel, anchovies, sardines, and herring. And if that's the case, the supplement is much, much cheaper to get the omega-3 fatty acids. You know, pre and probiotics sound good. Some people don't like to eat fermented foods. I do. I'm a Jewish kid from the Bronx. I love dill pickles. What can I say? My wife's Asian. We love kimchi. You know, have at it. However, not everybody does. So a good pre and probiotic will really get you over the top. And you know what? I haven't seen anybody get sick from having too many uh, good bacterial organisms yet. You know, I don't feel like enough people know what prebiotics are. Can you, I talk about it all the time in, you know, my population, but can you just give us some food sources that people might want to increase, right? We know a lot about the ferments, but we don't know enough about like your ferments aren't going to do much if you don't have the prebiotics alongside it. Right. So talk to me. Absolutely. You know, prebiotics feed the probiotics. So Mm -hmm. probiotics are great. Mean probiotics mean life, pro-life. Prebiotics of the food. If you take a probiotic and you don't have prebiotics, that probiotic, that bacteria has got to eat and it may start housing itself on your intestinal tract. So mm-hmm. that could pose an issue. A prebiotic is a non digestible carbohydrate serving as a food source for a probiotic. Great example would be asparagus, Jerusalem artichokes, chicory, garlic, and onions. They actually also aid in absorption of certain minerals like calcium, zinc, iron, and um, uh, I, I said zinc already. Well, I'm having one of those moments. I should have had my- It's not going to come until the end now. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to cut it for me. You need to no take your, your ferments and your pre <laughs> <laughs> Your mood going here. Um, so you, I love that. So you are all about food for supplementation Without later. Without question. What do you, so this is something that I was taught in over the years of my training and I probably have seen come to life more times than not. Of course, we always want to do food regardless of what's going on. But let's say somebody's really depleted. Let's say they had long, you know, they're having long COVID, they're really depleted in certain nutrients. Do you feel food is enough to get that repletion where it needs to be? Or is that a place where you do recommend, okay, let's short term, really, for lack of what better phrasing, mega dose the supplements alongside the food to get the repletion where it's at and then maintain with food? Oh, I think that's a great segue into supplementation because I do believe. Depleted cells cannot be repleted by food alone fast enough, especially when you're in a diseased state. So I use supplements to get that nutrient level up and Mm -hmm. I still feed people. You know, we're banking on somebody at 50 years old who's never really watched their diet, didn't understand the the difference between good quality food, processed food, organic farm, et cetera. And now we're asking them to eat a new diet make all these lifestyle changes, uh, it may be a little bit of an ask and a reach for us. Therefore, the supplements really bridge that gap. I love that. I love that you say that because I don't, there aren't many healthcare professionals out there. It's only a short time that we're having this podcast and conversation and it's all changed the diet, but it's hard. It's, It's a big ask and you can have support both with practitioners and supplements a long way to get you feeling better to the place where it becomes easier to do that ask and that reach, right? Um, you talk a lot about this in your your new book, right? And and approaches. Tell me, tell me about tell everyone the name of your book. Tell us a little bit more because I want to talk about that too. Because I know you have um, a seven R action plan to restoring the gut, which everybody needs to read and hear about. Right, Sh- shameless plug. The name of my book is Immune Reboot. maximizing your immunity, restoring gut health and optimizing vitality. It came out in December, hit the bestseller list. Very excited about it. Um, The book, the largest chapter in the book is the recipe chapter. And I'm going to tell you that most of the recipes 
my recipes that I use at home that my wife cooked. We have some celebrity chefs that added some things that pointed towards immunity, but that is the largest chapter. That took the longest editorial um, and that's the one I get asked the most questions about, because I think it really speaks to the idea that people don't, one, don't know what's healthy, and two, they don't know how, how to cook at home. And that was the one good thing about COVID, it enabled us to have to cook at home and to make better choices, because now some people who didn't cook at home were ordering out three times and bringing food home. So in theory, we should have got healthier during COVID, and we did it. Now, as far as which foods, you know, I usually give people here my top five foods that I recommend are my immune boosting yeah. foods. Real simple. I mentioned one of them before. It's an acronym smash. Uh, wild fish, salmon, mackerel, anchovies, sardines, and herring. Also the fatty fruits. The fatty fruits being olives, coconuts, and probably my favorite avocado. It's not a fatty fruit, but blueberries would fall in there. Also eggs. Egg is, eggs is without question a superfood with their yolk. Can we talk about eggs? I know I'm derailing. Yeah, yeah let's do it. Let, let, let's get in there. I, I'm all for eggs. Um, I get messages left and right on social media from people that are like, what's the deal with eggs, right? What's the deal? Everybody has different opposing opinions. It's bad for thyroid. It's it's just all around. We could keep going. It increases inflammation. So t give me the scoop, right? Because- yeah, yeah, yeah. So you give me your opinion. If you had to answer, if I was asking you, right, what's the deal with eggs? Is it going to increase my inflammation? Is it going to, is it going to cross react with gluten? Tell me, tell me the shindig here. Um, Put this look, one there, are, there are a lot of sensitivities. People have sensitivities to eggs because they eat it a lot. Yeah. So if you don't have a sensitivity to me, it is a literal super food. It's versatile. You can have it in a myriad of different uh, preparations. You can have it sunny side up. You can have it poached. You can have it anomaly. You can have it scrambled. You can have it hard, hard boiled. It's great protein. It's great fat. It has the one macronutrient that I think is most deleterious to people's overall health, and that is carbohydrates. It's not there. So it's got protein and it's got fat. So the big thing and the reason people think eggs are a problem is because they think the yolk has cholesterol. And it does. It has both good and bad. Here's the memo, everybody. And here's going to be our sound bite for the podcast. Are we ready? Okay. Dietary cholesterol ingestion does not raise serum cholesterol at all. What raises cholesterol is sugar consumption. So whoever's telling you that, I don't know how to say it any nicer than this. They haven't opened a book in the last 20 years and let's give it a rest. I, so my answer when people say that or a doctor says that is where'd you get that from? And now we're in a whole cholesterol tundra and that's fine because again, that's where they're thinking the inflammation is from. So eggs are a super food. I love it. And eggs are a good source of choline, which never gets, you know, any play in the nutrition world, I feel like, and we're all like, all of us are deficient in choline and it is so good for everything from that gut health, right? Gut health, gallbladder function, brain function, nerve, it's everything. So Alzheimer's, it decreases the laying down, it decreases the, what the microglial does in the brain. So choline is a hidden gem. And like you said, how many times have you had somebody say, can I have some choline supplement as opposed to, do you have vitamin D? Do you have a probiotic multivitamin? All great. Yeah. I would give choline to everyone before half these things. I give choline all the time. And, you know, the need, I wasn't even aware, you know, I've been doing this for a decade and I wasn't aware even as the nutritional value and needs for pregnant women and postpartum women until I had a baby and was like, wow, my needs go significantly up. And how many women who are pregnant are, can't look at protein, can't do anything. And it's, where's that support we need, right? So I love that we talked about, thank you for talking about eggs. Thank you for jumping into all the things I preach to people. <laughs> to you want to know a superfood? I, get, I, I know it's not what we did, wanted to talk about, but it's great for gut health and it's great for immunity. Yeah. One of my superfoods, organic coffee. Okay. Talk to me about, I'm a huge coffee lover. Well, I'm going to say it like my New Yorker. I went to public speaking school and I got rid of it all, but I want to say it. I want some coffee, man. Yeah, I want some organic coffee. My husband makes fun of how I'm from Albany uh, in New York, not not the city, but I get the hinge of that out when I say coffee to people. And he's always I'll like, I'll give you New York and Albany, but yeah, you don't get, from, the, you don't get I don't get the city, city, but I get stash. close enough that we get the hint of it coming into our accents. Um, right. Tell me how coffee benefits the gut because it's great. It's terrible. In that, it's, it's a plethora of polyphenols in a bean grind matrix. So again, the polyphenol. Elevate, right. I'm sorry. Start with what's a polyphenol. 
Oh, a polyphen polyphenol is a substance that has a lot of health promoting uh, factors. So specific polyphenols have antioxidant protection. Uh, they're all, it, believe it or not, coffee is good for the gut. Most people think it's not good for the gut acid and things of that nature. Incorrect. So here's how you make your job in the morning. Get your bean and try and grind it if you can. I know that's a little bit of a pain. I'm really sorry. Get your, gr your grinds, put it in a brown filter. Do not French press. What if you French, press? French press, you get all the sediment from... Uh, the coffee beans, and there's still toxins in it. The brown mm. filter filters yeah. out all the toxins. You don't want a white filter because the white filter has been bleached. Yeah. Coffee would be, regular coffee is the second or third, depending on a study you look, most sprayed item in America today. I mm. think cotton is number one. Yep. Coffee's pretty up so, there. Last so, old, last, yeah. So coffee is a great choice. You want to get it going, have some MCT oil, have a little monk fruit. Um, I, I know everybody's going to kill me on this. And again, this wasn't our intention, but we're going for it. I would avoid any dairy. Sorry, everybody. Um, I know I was just on a podcast in the Midwest and I, you know, I, there was like a blank for like three minutes. I think they pulled the plug on me to get off the dairy. <laughs> They're like, but, we're just going to wrap this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take it easy. Co coffee is a superfood without I question. Organic coffee, green beans. By the way, coffee is also a fruit. We talk about in our practice a lot, you know, people always like to have to rem remove my coffee. And we always just talk about coffee hygiene, which is sort of what you're talking about. How, you know, how are we having it? How can we can improve it? Grinding our own, getting cleaner coffee sources versus omitting. We hate omitting foods from our diet if we don't have to, unless obviously, you know, we know gluten is a strong connector for a lot of people. So I love, you know, you're supporting my messages all around. I, I have a question for you. What to say? that you had talked about earlier. And I, it actually, I wanted to ask it about 12 different things you've said, but I could be making up what I'm about to say. So just tell me I'm making it up and we'll put that down for everyone. Years ago, I was at a conference and both my friend and colleague, Todd Lapine was speaking, at, whom I love. And mm -hmm. he was talking about how, sorry, Todd, if I am misspeaking on this, but the very first individual who essentially I think died in the hospital from being a marathon runner was due to gut health and like LPS increasing and sort of what you were talking about, I think with translocation of bacteria. So I could be messing this up a little bit, but since this is your world of sports health and gut, and I would love to hear your thoughts on the gut in relation to um, more hardcore athletes, especially marathon runners, I see. You know, it, it's so funny when you bring that up because indeed over exercise or exercising more than two hours can damage the gut lining. And we look at athletes, we look at a LeBron James, a, a Tom Brady, I'm a basketball guy. So I'll list you all basketball guys, but I think you get the point. And we look at them and we think that they're uh, insurmountable in their immune system. And it's not true. Their immune system is really um, exposed with over two hours of exercise because it increases leaky gut syndrome. In addition to that, they actually may have shaky immune systems. Mm -hmm. So exercise on a good thing, regular exercise, the exercise that I try and do 30 minutes to 60 minutes a day promotes the growth of bacteria, which produces a short chain fatty acid called butyrate, which is the gold medal winner. Mm -hmm. It induces a shift in the gut microbiota that will improve metabolic functions. Unfortunately, women who performed three hours of exercise had a decrease in beneficial biodiversity, they had an increase in inflammatory signals. So exercise does alter our microbiome. It's a question of how long, how intense, and how much. Now, if you get LeBron James, Tom Brady, a Michael Phelps, uh, Serena Williams in your office, that doesn't mean you tell them to stop exercising. Hence the idea of making sure that you go through their foods. Hence you make sure you, you go through their supplementation. Now, I'm going to hit you with something again out of left field. If you look at, you know, I mentioned Serena. If you look at the tennis players, what food were they giving them at the U.S. Open in New York? Sushi. So my number one question I ask docs, I ask my patients, and here, here we are again. We're talking about food. We're getting off the rails. Is sushi a healthy food? And the answer is sushi, which means fish and rice, is not a healthy food mm -hmm. because I'm not so sure everybody wants to consume rice. Sushi rice is really sweet. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and it's sweet because it's got added sugar. It clumps together really nice because of the rice vinegar, which has gluten. So now you've got carbohydrates, added sugar, gluten, and you probably got, if you didn't ask for wild fish, you've got farm-raised fish, like a farm-raised salmon, which is usually toxic. So sushi could be healthy in interesting settings. Sashimi is better and or fish with a cucumber roll and everything of that nature. So just because people think it's commonly eaten, mm -hmm. things are healthy, they can even damage the athletes. I was appalled when I saw that. I was I was biting on my finger to keep my mouth shut because I had a free, yeah, I had a free ticket and didn't want to, you know, I wanted to get asked back. Yeah. <laughs> can I tell you as you were telling this story, uh, not the story, but the whole concept of these athletes actually having these shaky immune systems, not to make this about myself, but um, I flashback, I was a division one basketball player and I played way too much, like not just your general basketball. When I was a teen, I probably played on two to three teams at a time and played the whole game. So I would go and be in like these AAU basketball tournaments and be playing like eight plus games in a row in a weekend. And my immune system was crap. So I'm wondering, was there a bigger connection into how, how much I was doing and having some kind of, you know, intestinal, um, and my diet was terrible too. So some kind of intestinal permeability and kind of exposure, like you're saying, my immune system constantly being exposed. And that could have been a part of the puzzle I never would have thought of when I was a teenager. We didn't know this. I mean, when you look about gut health, 90% of all the gut health information has come out in the last five years. So it's incumbent on the practitioners to keep up with the information. And it's also incumbent on the patients to find that doctor who is reading the information. Uh, just what we talked about, many of the uh, uh, points, the important points have really come out in the last just few months. And look at immunity. Three years ago, who who was an immune expert that we knew, that we talked about in the space? There really wasn't that many of them, unfortunately. And that was the impetus for writing the book. Because yeah. in New York, where I live, I'm in Westchester County. I was six weeks, six weeks. I was six blocks for everybody was getting sick in March of 2020. By the time long hauler syndrome was coined, it's now called long COVID, which was May of 2020, which was coined by a Twitter expert. I already had patients that were having long haulers conditions. Then of course, there was some closures. There was a lot of virtual, et cetera, like that. So I wrote this book out of need for my patient base, because you and I, we both had a conversation before. It's patient first. As long as it's patient first, you and I are good. You know, that's, yep. that's you know, how you zone when you drive. That's how we zone in life. We, we see that patient or patients and we move forward. And um, that was the reason for the book. So for me, I'm trying to get that book in everybody's hands because I want people to understand the immune system. I want to have some recipes. I want them to fix their gut. Again, 80% of your immune cells are in your gut. I can't say that enough, even though I've said it about three times already. It really is. So where can people get your book or follow your information and learn more? Because you're a wealth of knowledge and, and many people, including my listeners who are always asking me things about COVID. And I'm like, I am not the expert for this. I am there to help support your gut and maintain that healthy barrier so that you can prevent, you know, severe illness. But so where can we get your book? Where can we access you? You can access me. My website is drrobertsilverman.com. I do a lot of social media. I, we do a lot of podcasts and um, my Facebook, my LinkedIn, my Instagram is, is drrobertsilverman.com. My book, real simple, Immune Reboot is the name. So it's immunereboot.com and or Amazon. You can get it there. Feel free to reach out to me. I'll tell you what I will do. The first three people who reach out, I will give a free book to. Oh, wow. Listen up, guys. Reach out. And I will make sure to link um, both ways to get the book directly and Amazon for those Amazon lovers out there. But I love this information. Thank you so much for coming on today and spreading just a wealth of knowledge about the immune system, the gut, COVID, all of it. Thanks for having me. You know, it's been my pleasure. So for everybody, remember, as Jim Roman said, take care of your body. It's the only place you have to live.